So I'll, I'm going to just really quickly touch on our steep slope initiative because, yeah, it's been around. Um, then I'm, I'm going to deviate from, you know, best management practices per se, and I'm going to spend a fair bit of time going over some recent research re results we have on tension because I think that that's, that's a, of a lot of interest, certainly to the people in BC. Um, there's not a lot of data like that that I've seen anywhere. I'll, I'll, I'm going to talk a fair bit on the tension trials and then I'm going to go through uh, best management practices. We produced a document last year that we just called a generic winch assist best management practices and it's, it's on our steep slope initiative website. And um, you know that's a year old and so we haven't been updating it as, as much as we can. Um, and things have evolved and like there's a lot of stuff you can talk about in best management practices and I certainly don't have all the answers. I'm a researcher, I'm not a logger. So, you know, I'm up here for an hour and I'd be really happy to engage with people. If you guys want to chime in about um, things that you see, if I'm touching on topics and you go, well, you know, we saw something like that, please speak up and contribute. It'll be a lot more interesting if you guys help me out and talk. So um, there's that and then I, I think um, we also have some BMPs for harvesters and forwarders and I kind of, I just threw that in there in case I have time at the end. Uh, but I, I probably won't get to that and then we'll have some discussion and feedback. Okay, so as for our steep slope initiative, we started that five years ago and um, you know, Winch Assist has come a long ways uh, since then. The first Climax came to BC in 2013. The first remote operated bulldozer came here in 2015. Um, now we have more than uh, 40 machines working in BC and actually lost count. Um, so, but Winch Assist is becoming more mainstream. So our five year um, steep slope initiative, we had the goals of improving working safe, worker safety, operating margins and in increasing uh, access to fiber and um, so we've, we've done all kinds of uh, trials. We had a big push initially at just uh, helping the companies getting the, the contractors to buy machines and getting information out there and, and I think we were pretty successful in assisting with that because there, there are a lot of machines now. So we're we're sort of winding down the steep slope initiative just because the funders are going like, yeah, you, you've, you've done a good job, but uh, you know, now we have to move on to uh, other things. Automation is, of course, our new, our new focus. And um, we will continue to do more work with uh, safety and, and productivity on, on winch assist, but it's, it's, not, it's not at the same scale that we used to do things. Oops. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. What's going on? Hang on. Sorry about that. Okay. So I want to talk about the tension trial that, that we did. Um, we, start, we, were, we had tension as a, as a main priority because we were concerned that, that uh, tension is not well understood. With, uh, with winch assist and certainly Rian Visser from the University of Canterbury, her, his early work showed that uh, there were spikes when the machine started moving. Uh, I think that the manufacturers have addressed that but we're still concerned what's going on with, with uh, tension. Certainly you can see on, on the internet some really nasty um, videos of winch assist machines coming over the road cuts and basically going perpendicular. I didn't even want to show that. I think that that's like the media sensationalizing terrorism and uh, it just looks so, so bad. But uh, so, so loggers are prone to, to uh, pushing the limits. We're concerned about complacency. You know, four years in, there haven't been any, any uh, serious accidents but people are, we're hearing that, oh, you know, We've got it figured out. It's 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 not a problem, and but we've also seen stuff where people don't put their movement sensors out there, or they may not be doing their uh, inspections, and uh, like I say, the the uh, loggers do tend to push the limits. So, are there concerns with tension? 
Um, also in, in BC, I think that our, our conditions here may be a little bit more challenging than, than many places in the world and where we did this trial down in Washington, there's nice deep soils, but around here we've got uh, thin soils, rock outcrops, wet soils, frozen ground, all these things you know, can lead to poor, poor traction and high tension. So we thought that tension is not well understood and we wanted to fill in some of the gaps. So um, that's why I'm, I'm kicking this best management practices off because we wanted to <laughs> fill in these gaps around tension. So um, we did this in Washington, like I say, because it's actually really hard to find collaborators here in BC. We, we thought we've got, this, we've got this great research project that we want to do and everybody was just so concerned about their balance sheets after all the shutdowns from fires that we had a real hard time finding collaborators. So I called up uh, Travis Ridgeway in, uh, at Warehouser and uh, I said, would you be interested in, in helping us out with some collaboration? And he goes, oh yeah, sure, like come on down. And then next day I've got four contractors that we want you to do and and uh, the collaboration we had down there was amazing. Um, when we were first starting about this project, we were talking to John Deere and they've also been amazing with their collaboration and they said, yes, we share the same concerns with tension. We, we did a similar thing. We had some load cells out on machines and we saw spikes that didn't make sense when we watched the video, like what's going on? So we think that, uh, yeah, yeah, tension is a concern. Um, when we tried it, uh, there were lateral confounding forces on the load cell and by the way, the load cell only lasted minutes before it was destroyed from locking. So they designed and built um, specialized load cells for us for this that are nice and compact and strong. And uh, so many thanks to, to Deere and Weyerhaeuser for, for the great uh, collaboration and then we work with uh, MVR logging, that's Monty Rask and CNC logging to assess the summits and uh, the EMS system. So as you can see in the lower slides, there's uh, we, we put load cells on the buncher and then we had GoPros in front of the tension displays of the anchor machines. And we had then, then to transpose the, the information off the videos. So we had, uh, we were able to compare the tension at the buncher and the anchor. And we, we only did this at once per second because that's the data logger we had and going off the video, yeah, it's, it's tedious. So we're not capturing all the spikes at, at one data point per second. There's probably more going on. It can jump probably up to several tons within a second. Um, but I think the data that we have is, is still worthwhile. It, it it's, does paint an interesting picture. Um, our trial aimed for representative uh, logging conditions where we did production logging. We just let the guy go and he's in lead and he's just operating as normally. And then we set up some uh, stump redirects uh, as well and, and we are really looking to compare the tensions with the redirects or the, or the rub stumps. Uh, versus production logging. So here's one of the first uh, stump redirects we did. Um, redirecting, siwash, catching, rub trees, whatever you want to call it. Uh, siwash is sort of uh, is not a good term and so we're going with the redirects now. I'm going to talk about redirects. So on this stump you can see there's a 75 angle redirect and, and that did change as, as he did multiple swaths up and down the hillside. It was fairly gentle terrain on the upper right there. You can see it's only, it's only about 40% there. Um, and in, in that lower middle slide you can see that he sawed through the stump pretty fast. He went up and down twice, out of, you know, about 100 meters. And that was a 65 centimeter stump and he sawed through it, three quarters of it in uh, in like I say, two up and down passes and, and uh, we walked up to it then and, and went like, oh gee, this is going to fail. And uh, you know, we're, we're all concerned and the operators, ah no, it's, it's no problem. You know, if it, if it failed, there's other stumps right here, right here, it'll just catch on the other stump. And we're going, 
Okay, yeah, all right. You'd still get some shock. We were concerned because you'd still get shock loading do doing that. And this sort of goes back to the complacency we're talking about that, that, that is a concern for us. So it was a cold day, five degrees. Um, the wire rope was hot to touch. We'd, as soon as he stopped, we'd run up and we had a heat gun and we were grabbing the rope and it was hot to touch. But we'd get in there with a heat gun and, and the highest temperature we could get was 60 degrees. So we didn't see any you know, concern for, for temperature. That was one of the early concerns uh, that we'd heard from, from New Zealand that you could spit on and it would sizzle and that, and that could uh, you know, degrade the integrity of swage rope. It could get more brittle with high temps. But it's very hard to measure that temperature. We would have to get sensors in there. We, tried, we initially tried to do that with uh, sensors, but it cut through the material so fast. So it's hard to get the good temperatures. It conducts it, uh, with the heat really well. And, and, uh, but generally, we didn't think it was that big of a, of a, of a concern. Um, we instrumented the stump with accelerometers and measured it with string potentiometers to, so that we can uh, see how it moved and reacted to the forces on it. Um, or we can also determine the tension on the stump because we know what it is above and below the cable. But we didn't get that analysis done yet. So what were you I'm just going to get to that. Ah. OK, so this is a fairly um, small snapshot. I'm, don't, sorry, I apologize. You can't read all the, the fine print. But it's really, it's only, like, this is 20 minutes of time. And the blue line is the buncher, and the red line is the anchor. So generally, um, the buncher was less than the anchor, uh, especially with the redirects. And on the green raised um, the bars at the bottom indicate uphill travel. So on the left, he's at the top of the hill and he's going down. And when he'd stop, there'd be um, the drum would, would pull in, indicating an upward travel, but really he's just stopped and working. So he's working his way down the hill, stopping a couple times. And, uh, and then uh, on the right side of the graph, when he's at the bottom of the hill, then he's starting back up. And so the tensions were low for the most part when the uh, machine is heading down, which is what you expect. He's pulling the cable out. The settings drop right away to lower the tension. Um, you do see some um, cases where the the buncher tension is higher than the anchor when, when he's going downhill because he is pulling it out faster. And then um, the high tensions when he's going uphill are working. And here you can see the, 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 um, the difference between the red and the blue lines in those, those big spikes. Um, that, that's the difference is about 19, and the, with the one arrow is 19% in the far right. It's 34 percent, and that's because the, the friction of the stump is preventing all that tension from getting to the to the buncher. You know, it's it's kind of it's kind of what you'd expect. Jeff, yeah. Does it make a difference with those tension spikes because the stump is a lot of constant tension machine, so when you think you're stopping, it's a point, right? You get a tension shock, right? You want that? Uh, it's pretty comparable to the EMS, which had we'll see that when you, when you get to the EMS data. Um, it, it didn't have the same kind of constant control as the, uh, as the EMS, but basically they, they both, when you combine the, 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 the two tensions with the EMS, they're, they're both, they're fairly comparable, right? How was the machine being used? Was it, uh, was it just for the basis of the test, or was it actually cutting and stopping the cut and then working, traveling, etc.? Exactly. Good question. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. So the first. Yeah, I've got a mic that I can give people to. So, yeah, the first, the first question, what was the first question? Um, 
was it was it affected by the uh, the summit because it wasn't a constant tension machines so it was the summit you know more spiky because Not really, no, not, no, I think that uh, there's always going to be a little bit of spikes because um, the buncher is faster than the rest of the systems, right? It has to go through the comm system and then the hull, hydraulics and the anchor machine have to, to respond to that and it's that, to keep up with that kind of speed is hard, but I think that the manufacturers have figured that out to, to some degree and um, so, um, what the operator often did, I was a little perplexed, is it because you can see the, um, the feet out on the, on the display and when he's going down and stopping lots of times like he was, he'd fall and bunch or in some cases shovel downhill and he seemed to stop and then back up, you know, dig himself in and it was that back up, well yeah, you had a, you, that certainly spiked. So there's, a, there's some of these operational things that, that cause these spikes. So, um, but I think this is, this is interesting um, that you have the difference between the anchor and the buncher is like 20 to 30 percent and I think that that's what you'd expect with the effect of, of wrapping around a stump. And then um, right there you can see that the, the highest tension we measured here was 24.5 tons traveling uphill. So that was uh, the, the one inch swaged rope they used had a um, 162,000 pound rating. So if you take a third of that and convert it to metric tons, that's 24.5 tons. That's right at the safe work, working load for that rope right there. Um, so the, uh, the, the summit also measures the tension um, right at the pin, so you're, you're getting pretty good um, measurements of, of the tension off the anchor machine. Um, let's see what else. Jim, was this at 40% slope? The question is if it's at 40% slope. Yes, it is. Yeah. What size is the rope? One inch swage. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that was our first uh, stump redirect. And this is what it looked like, to what the stump looked like, if I can just, just a quick video watching the stump. That's about the speed he moved at and yeah, it's, it's sawing through that stump. We were sitting in the truck watching this, it goes, oh, it's smoking. And, uh, and then we were out the next day with uh, Frank Chandler. Ah, that's just steam. And I, oh, well, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I, think, I think that's right. It was, uh, there's a lot of moisture out there. It was raining. And, uh, you know, we don't think that we saw the temperatures where you're going to have charring or, and it didn't persist. We think it, it was, that's just the, the steam that comes off. So here's, here's another one. Um, this time we compared a block and a, and a redirect. So on the left, and, and you can, there's a little diagram of the block, it was a 35 degree redirect. This was on a significantly steeper slope, it was 90%. And so um, you can see again on the left, he's starting downhill. There's a few little spikes where he stopped to work. And then, um, then he came back up the hill and he, he he was working more coming back up the hill and here he was shoveling, he was stopping and shoveling down and so you, you see the, the difference between the buncher and the anchor um, and then um, so we did that once up and down with the block and he said alright let's take the block off and wrap it around the, the stump and, uh, and, and look at the tension there. Um, unfortunately, we were a little pressed for time. It, it was, uh, they blew a hose, it was the end of the day, so it was a pretty quick trip up and down the hill with the stump. But it's pretty interesting. You can see that uh, if you compare the peak tensions with the block to the stump, stump's a little less. 
I think if, it had, if we'd uh, spent more time working and eating into the stump, that tension would have gone up. Um, and then looking at the differences in tension between the buncher and the anchor, it's kind of surprising that, um, you know, there was only 25% um, difference with the block and 30% difference with the uh, stump redirect. And it was, as I say, it was pretty nasty conditions. It was 90% and really raining hard and, and slippery and uh, it was a, the operator's comments were, you know, did, did you have trouble getting back up? Are you, comfor are you comfortable doing this? Yeah, no, it's no problem, no problem. And uh, did you have trouble getting back up? And he says, oh yeah, it was a lot harder with the stump and, and were your tracks slipping? Oh yeah, yeah they were. So I think this is, uh, it's good about the trial that we actually did capture really tough conditions. It was, it was close to, uh, you know, operational logging, but we at least we, we did get data from some fairly challenging conditions here. Um, but we were surprised that the tensions weren't higher with the stump and the, and the differences w weren't more. And I was just talking with, with Brian Tour and who's going to be presenting on wire rope. And it's, it's surprising that there wasn't a, a bigger difference between the block and the stump. But that's the data. It's, uh, it's small sample. This is just really only one comparison and it's a small amount of time and I think it sort of indicates the, the need for more data and to understand this more. So this is just so, sort of a preliminary indicator. Um, so then uh, how, do the, how does the redirect tension compare with just operational logging when he's in lead. So I, I uh, you know, we had hours of, of time that we had, uh, of data that we looked at, but you know, you can't show everything. So I just took uh, a representative, uh, not a representative, this is a, the, the highest tension we got. And I thought it was interesting, like on the left there, you can, he starts at the, at the bottom of the hill and he's working his way up. And, and here you can see that the difference between the anchor and the buncher isn't so great. That's more normal. The difference was higher when you had the stump and all that friction that was siphoning off the tension getting to the buncher. You don't see that so much here. But uh, still there's um, resistance as the cable is going out over the ground. So there was more tension required at the bottom of the hill. And as he came up the hill, it was slightly less. And then, um, the highest peak we saw of all the data, you know, I thought, what's going on there? What happened with this, uh, where is it 24.7? So that's just over the, the safe working load of 24.5, pretty, pretty similar. And um, we had videos in the cab that was recording the, the tension off the display, but you could also see out the windows what's going on. So it was pretty interesting that they, the, um, the buncher tension spikes above the anchor there and like what was going on there. So he was shoveling the logs to a road below and he was, so he's reaching up, grabbing a log, slewing it and tossing it down the hill. So when you've got 40 tons on a 90% slope, you've already got a lot of gravity working against that, that machine and that's why you're at that, uh, you know, pretty high levels of 20, 20 one or 22 tons, then the momentum of that log going from above them, slewing down below, that's what caused the spike. There's two spikes there over a period of a few minutes and that corresponds to the, to the shoveling. So there's a lot of operational things that, that can affect the tension and the spikes, whether he's um, changing direction and heading uphill or slewing or um, climbing up over a stump and then coming down. Um, all these things have um, effects on tension. Um, but you know, this is the big one right here. This is the biggest thing we saw and it wasn't, it wasn't common. It wasn't a high frequency and it's pretty, pretty much 
the safe work limit, but it, I don't think we, we didn't see any crazy tensions getting up to half the braking strength or anything. So, and these, these tensions are not that different from what we saw with the redirect. Did you get any data where an operator was actually um, trying to go uphill and then using the boost button at any particular time to get that extra energy to get over a stump or over or through a hole? No. Okay. No. Um, the, he, there were, with the EMS machine, you know, they used the different settings. We'll get to that. Um, and you can see in the video where he's climbing over a stump, I, uh, but no. They were working at, at just regular, um, the fairly high tensions. It was, most of this stuff was pretty steep. Um, they didn't need it. Thanks for the question. Any, please, if you guys have questions. Okay, so moving on to the EMS. Um, this time we started off doing multiple tree redirects. They thought, no, we don't usually do just one stump, we do three. And he said, well, we still want to have some sharp angles so that we can see what's going on. So there was a total of three degrees of, of redirect um, with, with this one. The, the one in the lower left there is actually at 45 degrees, so they thought that was, well, they wouldn't norm they said, no, we wouldn't normally do a 45 re degree redirect. And, uh, and this also shows the two lines rubbing together. And um, so you, there is metal on metal and that rope is moving through that stump and, uh, or tree. Um, so with this graph here, I combine the tension of both lines just so that you could compare it to the summit. Um, this, is, this is both of them combined. So it holds very steady, just below 20 tons um, when he's moving uphill, which is not dissimilar from the summit, and, which makes sense because they're very similar feller bunchers they're, and they're on comparable slopes and they're both using the same kind of tension to get up the hill. Um, there's the, it's pretty much all uphill except for the, the little dips at the bottom. The purple bars are the different settings. So, He's at a much higher tension, um, or setting, I mean, um, going uphill. The one on the right, that was basically when he was climbing up on the road and, and moving around, so that's not so representative. Um, but we were curious, again, this is, this is the highest spike that we saw with the EMS, and that you can see where the buncher um, spiked up to, uh, what is it, uh, over, over 25 tons, and the, in this one there was an individual line that reached 15.9 <coughs> tons, which was pretty high for, for the EMS. And, uh, and again, like what happened here? Because it was, uh, it's a change of direction. What took me a while to figure it out from the video, but it was, it was climbing up, it was the top of his swath, and he was uh, repositioning for his next swath, so he put his, put his head down, changed his pads and headed off in a new direction. And that's, and then you had a, you had a lot of t tension on one cable as he, as he shifted direction, and then he headed down, and then there was that 25 ton spike as, as he headed back down, just from the change of direction. So, you know, again, it's, these aren't high numbers, and, and it's, there are operational things that do affect tension, um, but, um, that was with the three tree siwash too, with 68 degrees. So, but I, I don't think it was, you know, an alarmingly high amount of tension. Yeah, so no, I was, when I was just talking to uh, Lars yesterday about, uh, Lars Rose, Rosewern uh, about uh, some of this data and, and, and he was, uh, had concern about uh, the redirects and the metal on the metal and, and his concern was that, well, when you're, when you're have that friction, you can uh, burn off your lubrication in your, in your rope. 
And so you might want to consider lubricating the rope. So that, you know, our, our data doesn't show, you know, alarmingly high tensions and, but, you know, are there other things going on? Um, like it affecting the lubrication of the rope. I mean, that was a, that was an interesting point that Lars brought up. Yeah. Was there also a measurement on temperature with the two rope system and uh, measuring that friction with the the two lines cutting into the sump? Yeah, we found slightly slightly less temperatures with the EMS. You know, it, we, didn't, we didn't see anything over 60 degrees, and it certainly did not saw through the, the, the stump as fast as the single line system. There's a huge, huge difference there. That's three stumps versus one. Yeah. Yeah, but, st you know, even still with that, there was a... Yeah. Yeah, it was three stumps versus one, that's correct, um, but there was still 45 degrees and, and it didn't, there were multiple passes up and down and, and we, it was clear that the, that the rate that it sawed through, and it makes sense because it was, the, the single one was just like a, more of a, of a saw blade effect. Okay, so here's our, uh, we did a second, we, we, you know, as, as he worked along, we, we cut the, the one stump and, and uh, moved, uh, moved up and did uh, another redirect. Uh, this one had a total of 56 degrees. And um, here I've, I've, the graphs show individual lines. They weren't, they're not, the last one is combined, so uh, if, you, if you look, maybe you can't see it, but if you look at, there's, there's pink and blue for line one and line two. And so in the, in the top graph, that's the anchor machine. And it's, you can see it's holding very steady near 10 tons um, when it's traveling uphill. And at the, in the bottom graph, that's um, at the buncher. And so you see more variability there. Um, st still not huge differences between um, the two ropes and the Again, the, the directions of uh, travel on the green bars, and it's, it's actually traveling downhill a small proportion of the time because he moves fast when he's going downhill, and when he's parked stationary, that's still indicated as, as uphill too. So that's why you see so little um, downhill. Um, and here with this redirect, we saw the, the buncher tension going up to 12 tons. So not a big not a big difference with the with the redirect here. Um, one, uh, I think that it's it's interesting that the that the anchor machine is is so steady at the ten tons, and I I think there's a it's there's a difference that the summit um, measures the tension from a, a pin. And the EMS measures it from the hydraulic pressure in the, in the motor and has an algorithm. And so it's more of an indirect uh, measurement. So you probably don't see um, you know, the responses as much in the, in the anchor machine data here. Um, again, back to um, comparing a to just uh, operational production logging. And um, this is, we, again, we pulled out the piece with uh, the highest spike that we saw in, these are the two individual lines. So in this case, there's one line that spiked up to 14.8 14 tons. And I looked at the video over and over again, and, I, and he's just cutting and bunching, looks pretty regular to me, and I, I can't see any reason for this um, for this spike, he did something that you know I, I can't tell, but I think it, it just speaks to the fact that there are um, tension increases just from from different operational activities. But you know they're in very reasonable ranges. So that's it for for my data. Um, we were concerned that that you could get. Um, high tension spikes from operational loggers. 
We did see some high tension here, but uh, you know it, w it didn't happen that often and not at dangerous levels. Um, the max we saw with the summit was 24.7 tons, just just over the um, safe work limit of 24.5 for that certified rope. Um, in the EMS, the max we saw was 15.9 tons. The comparable safe work limit for that their 7 8 inch swage rope was 17.6 tons, so it's well within that. Um, so even though this is small sample, um, you know, it's judging by what, what we have here, and it, I would say we, we do need to have more information to support all this. Basically, if you follow the, the recommended manufacturer's methods, there, there shouldn't be a problem with tension. Um, if, you, if poor practices uh, with do cause frequent spikes in tension, then yeah, the integrity of the opponent's components could be, a fa could be impacted and the safety factor would, would decline. And that would, you would have to look at all the components from the, the rope to the chain to the connector, um, the shackles, the pins, the drum components, all that should be rated out for the tensions that, that you're going to expect and you should stay within that one third of the breaking strength. So um, we, we still think that, that tension is, is not well understood. We would like to see data loggers um, that, that you can look at this data. I think it's very instructive to actually see what's going on and, uh, and it's not that hard to put a GoPro in the camera too, but if, if you uh, could see where your, your spikes occurred and, and you could think back uh, about what you did at that time, I think there are opportunities to improve your working practices so you could um, smooth out those spikes. You know, maybe you can um, position yourself like the, the one operator was, was pulling back up, digging himself in. Um, but that was at a high tension and if you can, um, you know, position yourself so that you're working at a lower tension or mindful of the events that can trigger tension, um, you know, I think it would be better for the operator, for the systems not to, not to have those, to try to avo avoid those spikes. But the systems are basically designed for, for a lot of those spikes. And, we think having a data logger would be, be very good to see what's going on, that you could review it, analyze it, see what's causing um, spikes, and also it would be due diligence. We've had discussions often that um, if, if, if some, an incident did occur, if you got pulled down the hill, um, I wouldn't be surprised if the regulator came back and say, can you demonstrate that you were using best practice and due diligence? And if you've got a record of your tension that shows that you're operating within safe limits, that's good due, di due diligence. So, um, let's see what else. So yeah, well, we were expecting higher, higher tensions with the stump redirects. Um, some spikes did occur, but you know the differences in tension compared to operational logging just weren't that great. Um, we saw that uh, the shoveling downhill caused a bit of a spike, but you know that's not too surprising. Um, it was surprising with the uh, the comparison of the block to the, to the stump. We expected that there would be more of a benefit um, using the block to reduce tension. Um, that's just one data point, one comparison. Um, I think we want to look at that some more, but there's, you know, this supports that, you know, maybe you don't need to hang a block. But I would caution on that. It's, it's a small damp data point. Um, also, there's, there's a lot of design variations with the, with the different winch assist models and, and it's expected that they would have different responses. So it's difficult to generalize for, for all winch assist systems. I think that uh, there's, a, there's a lot of similarities, but you know, we'd be interested to, to do more studies um, with different systems and, and get some more data. Jim? Yeah. Was that the 
The breaking strength on the 7 eighths line, I think that number that you have there is just regular swedge, and we're using like compact swedge, so I think that number is a little bit low for... for that was off the specs that you provided to me. For the right? compact swedge? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's metric ton, so... Yep, seems it is. Know. Yeah. Yeah, Frank, Frank Chandler was, was uh, on site with us here when you were doing the EMS machine, and uh, again, like, uh, awesome collaboration, so thanks a lot, Frank. So what are the take-home messages here about best practices? I think that if you're, uh, if you're gonna do redirects, um, use the multiple trees, um, like, like we saw with the EMS there. I think that's a good way to go. Single stumps can fail. They do have high forces. Um, there's, a, there's a multiplier effect at, at 30 degrees your multiplication factor would be 0.5 so with 10 tons of cable force that's 5 tons at the stump at 45 degrees with a multiplication factor of 0.8 you'd have 8 tons of force on the stump theoretically so if the stump fails the cable's going to jump and we actually took pictures of that where you can see on the left there's a cable wrapped around uh, a stump, and we thought, mm, looks like it's going to fail, and it did. You can see the root ball on the right. The cable jumped to adjacent stumps, and you know, like the operator told us, and he said, yeah, you have a holy shit moment, but it's not catastrophic. It's going to catch. It's no big deal. But, um, but you do, you're going to have shock loading. That is going to affect the, the integrity of your rope, and it's just, I think, Instead of using a single stem or stump, you'd be better off wrapping around a couple. And, you know, these redirects are pretty common. Um, a lot of people are setting up their anchor machines parallel to the road because maybe the road's not wide enough um, or they really like the productivity gain you get from um, just using the redirects and not having to go back and move your, your anchor machine so much. So we've heard about this, we've seen a lot of this. Um, so we're, we would just recommend that you use um, multiple stumps when you're doing these redirects. Um, and there's one manufacturer that actually has that and his, his recommendations is to use multiple stumps. Um, there's a safety benefit because if the machine were to get pulled down, it's not going to, if you're in lead, it's not going to come down on you. It's, you've got trees in the bite in between you. Um, and, uh, and there's a big productivity gain, as I said. I think you do need to watch the uh, angles and your diameter ratios of the stumps that you're going to use with the redirects. And, and Brian will talk more about that with wire rope. Um, with, it's important that the operators do a understand the effects of the different operational activities that they do on, on tension. And also, um, you should dig in on the road and make sure that your anchor machine's not gonna move. And if you do dig in, um, you should make sure that the holes in the road are filled in. There's actually a safety alert out of, out of Washington where uh, they, they didn't fill the road in properly and a haul truck uh, hit that hole and it wasn't safety, it wasn't a, a serious event but it, it just raised the issue that you got to make sure you fill them in and think about the traffic that's coming afterwards. Okay. So that's it for my, uh, for the tension data. And um, is there any more questions or any discussion about uh, tension or does, it, does anybody have any ex experience or any other contributions of their thoughts on, on redirects or, or tension? Hey Jim. That, I'd love to hear from you guys. Hey Jim, I just wanted to uh, ask the question around redirects. Are you talking about a redirect where the rope was actually around all those stumps and actually working into them or is a redirect where you have a stump that might be back, uh, you know, 20 meters that the rope would, would glide to. Because, well, yeah. Yeah, okay. like, what, the, like what, what we did with the summit, that was an in individual stump that it was wrapped around, but with the EMS, there was, we ha had it around three, three trees, and that's what we would recommend, is that, that it would go around multiple stems. 
And you didn't see much change in the tensions by having three stones versus one? Limited data sample. Um, yeah, I would say that there was less ten slightly less tension with the, with the three. But I think that that's something that, you know, I, We'd like to we'd like to look at it more and get yeah. some, get some more data. I'm just interested as well. I'm not uh, saying yeah. one's better than the other. I just know that there's been steep slope machines that are down the hill, and they're going around multiple stumps, and then they don't have the power to get back up uh, because of the the loss of power on each one of those stumps taking away from the machine. So there's a little bit of a balance there to Correct. what we want to do. Correct. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering, are you planning on doing any uh, research surrounding stumps failing and whether that shock loads uh, after a fail of a stump and what that yeah. might look like to the shock loading? We'll see. You know, we have, first we have to get more money to, to continue this. and. Uh, there's a lot of interest and in, you know I was just down in Washington uh, this week and uh, talking to uh, Washington Labor and Industries is sort of the, the research side of their regulatory agency is comparable to WorkSafe and I was talking about this stuff and they are really interested they have money so they would like to continue this warehouser would like to continue this um, when I present tomorrow to WorkSafe we'll see if we can get money from them and um, you know, talking with uh, Keith from New Zealand, you know, they're all looking at, at the very similar questions. Everybody's looking at the same kind of questions. So um, we did have, um, we do have data on the on the forces on the stumps, and I think if we were going to do it again, we would certainly instrument the stumps up, and and look at uh, whether or not we'd get them to fail. Hmm, maybe. Um, We'll see. You kind of mentioned that oh shit moment when the stump does fail, but I wonder what... Yeah, and the measure of the shock loading of it catching on the other stumps. That, that might not be a bad idea, just to, just to see what is the shock loading. Um, yep. Cool. Any other questions? Hang on a second. Hang on. Hang on. I think what you're doing is really good and really important. So in the future, if you are going to do other studies, we'd like to you know, help you find uh, an operator with the Falcon Winchester to do a study on that as well. Absolutely. And yeah. I, I just talked with Dale yesterday. As soon as you get a machine in BC that has a data logger on it for tension, like let us know. Because uh, we, we'd, we, where there are data loggers, like we, we would love to, to look. That's the low-hanging fruit. Okay. Um, because this going off the videos is, is sucks. Yeah. And uh, we, we got to find a better way to, to, to instrument this data. And I can also mention that, uh, well, I, think, I think you mentioned it, Keith, that uh, Keith's group came up with a, um, a tension monitoring device that Reed Visser came up with that will show, and it's on, and it's on Dale's machines, that shows the, the tensions in a, in a nice display relative to uh, safe work and, and braking limits. And there's no reason why we can't plug that in to machines that have um, load cells right now. And yeah, so we can definitely do that for you, so we'll catch up maybe later and work out yeah. a Yeah, because yeah, we, you know, Warehouser for sure wants to, uh, to do this with uh, the ROB and the Falcons. Yeah. And so we just need to put it together. Okay. Cool. All right, got, uh, looks like half an hour left, so. Um,